Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to Bleeding Cool's recap of American Horror Story Cult. That would be the seventh season, and we are going to be taking a look at the seventh episode. And because it's a long title, I'm going to my cheat sheet. Uh, episode seven, Valerie Solanus died for your sin scumbag. Um, which, like, right off the bat, is a great episode. Uh, but let me not be rude. Let me thank you guys for coming back and joining me for this recap. Uh, we're well past the halfway point with last week's episode. Uh, again, I think we took a little bit of a break in the action. I don't think we had a ton of forward momentum in the storyline, but I, I'm really okay with that. I'm going to compare it to American Gods. American Gods, when I was doing the recap, they had a standalone episode where we got to see a little bit about the backstory about Mad Sweeney. I liked it, but I thought it really kind of pulled itself away from the entire season, more stuck out than blended in. So I had issue with that when I was doing it at the time. Still liked it, but this different. One, we do get a little bit of poor momentum with the storyline, but Lena Dunham uh, is just, is fantastic. Her work with Evan Peters is incredible, but I don't want to diminish Lena Dunham, who I, I know I've been pretty much hot and cold when it comes to her with some of this past things she's done. I, I think she's fascinating in interviews, though. Um, but in this, if she's not getting an Emmy nomination for this, then, then I don't know who they give Emmy nominations out to. So, uh, without further ado, I just want to make sure everybody knows I'm my cool official Bleeding Cool shirt. Um, and because of the, ho because of the holidays, I got my Jason hockey mask, so I just want to make sure I'm showing all my proper street, street, street geek cred. Try saying that fast five times. And I think if you look over there, you'll see that bag where I'm pointing it. Yeah, that's a leftover of the red vines. I'm just showing a little bit behind the scenes. But I digress. Okay, let me jump in. Again, there's not a lot of super detail to go into. Um, what I thought fascinating about, and my biggest takeaway from the episode overall, it really starts giving us a history of cult leaders and cult mentality. And we get the backstory, which I didn't know a lot about, about Valerie Salinas, for those of you who don't know. Um, she's the one who shot Andy Warhol. And right off the bat, what I thought about their dynamic that was interesting was, in a sense, between them, you had two conflicting cult figure personalities. Andy Warhol had his cult of the time, and we see, uh, as this continues on, Valerie Salinas has her scum group, and we'll go into that uh, in a few minutes. So I thought that was a very interesting dynamic that we're going to see play out, or possibly not, towards the end of the episode to give a little bit of a teaser. Um, but let me give a little bit of a recap. Um, in the very beginning, we see what leads up to Valerie shooting Andy Warhol. A lot of it has to do with Valerie not feeling like her work uh, as an artist because she's a female is being respected and Andy Warhol makes no bones about it. Um, he, in the portrayal here, he just is not a, uh, a big fan of the idea of women and being artists and having creative minds. So right off the bat, we know where this conflict's going to lead and where it leads basically is to gunshots. Um, we cut to credits, we come back, and then we start to see a little bit of an update, uh, what happened from the previous week. Uh, we see there are news reports about the assassinate, quote unquote assassination attempt that was attempted on Kai. Uh, we find out that Ali is still in custody, though it looks like Meadow is the one who is getting the full blame for it. And, of course, Hilton and everybody are going around to make sure they disparage her character as much as they possibly can. Um, Hope, uh, it's getting very interesting because we see that Kai now, with everything that's going on and then the assassination attempt and everything, Kai won the councilman's seat by a landslide. Um, and with that win and with that power, Hope is starting to notice that things are changing. Uh, new members are being brought on board. Uh, a very guy-oriented uh, number of, of uh, members being added to the cult. Um, she calls into question um, essentially about the sharing of power. Um, that agreement that was made in the very beginning that Kai said absolutely, which I think all of us knew just wasn't going to happen. Um, but that's already starting to rub hope the wrong way. It feels like she's been doing a lot for more for Kai than what Kai's been doing for her in the long run. There is a good point where Meadow um, is brought up by Hope, um, where Hope is really challenging uh, Kai on this idea of what, why did Meadow have to be sacrificed, which and essentially alluding to this idea of what, how many of us are easy to be sacrificed for what you're looking to do. And the reason why we know this is because Hope has met up with Bibi. Bibi, Francis Conroy, who we find out was Valerie Solanus' lover. Um, who uh, was there as it was all going on and is letting Hope know, like, look, this is how it happens. Guys get power. Guys start sacrificing the women. The women never get the respect they deserve, and they're always basically left to rot while the guys take all the power and the glory. And we're going to see how that plays out into the uh, Valerie Solanda story uh, as it's chugs along. 
But what we get is we get BB, Ivy, Winter, and Hope now all meeting up at the butchery. Um, the uh, Hope sold, but she needs to kind of get the forces together. And who better to do that than BB? Um, we already have Ivy and Winter there. So essentially, BB starts to relate to them the story of, of what happened specifically after the assassination attempt. Um, she states again that Valerie was the love of her life. Um, they talk about the Scum Manifesto, which in the beginning was Valerie's claim to essentially empower women, get women in positions of power and control, and start having major influence and not have men be in any position of power or responsibility. Uh, the Scum Manifesto by the Scum standing for the Society for Cutting Up Men. So you'll notice very subtle, subtle name for the, uh, for the organization. Um, there's a uh, interesting point where we see and we kind of get the impression, and, and it was my fault not knowing as much about the backstory as I usually do, um, but there is a point where after the assassination of Warhol, the scum devotees start going out and also attacking people, couples that are in, the, are in a car, couples that are out, in the, uh, are out picnicking. And we find out, and this is the one thing that really threw me, is they basically, Ryan Murphy throws it out there that Valerie Salinas and her scum followers were Zodiac. Um, and for those of you who don't know who Zodiac was, um, Zodiac was a killer in San Francisco. From what we have been told and for what we know, the Zodiac killer was, were killing people um, in public and was sending out Zodiac messages to the newspaper trying to give them clues and to try to communicate with them. And then one day Zodiac just stopped all completely clear. There have been speculation, there have been rumors about who Zodiac was, but there, there was never anything concrete. Now, apparently, what, what Ryan Murphy is saying is Valerie Salinas and her followers were Zodiac. And essentially, someone started to claim the work, which sent Valerie over the edge. It's just another instance of another man taking responsibility for women's work. Turns out, at least in this storyline, that it came down to Bruce and Maurice. And Bruce was the Zodiac. Maurice was the one that was essentially his partner, but was guilt by association. And Valerie, by now anyway, was sick of men. Up to this point, she was okay with men who were willing to degrade their gender or okay with gay men to be part of it. But now she wanted no one to be a part of it. And with this whole Zodiac thing happening, it was considered to be an ultimate slight uh, to her and to her group and her belief. So again, they, uh, they take care of matters as you would expect. What they end up doing is they end up killing them and positioning their bodies in, in various ways to make it look like some kind of ritualistic Zodiac killing, even made more so by the fact that their genitals were found in their mouth. So again, a lot of different connotations for it, but they were clearly, clearly sending a message. What you ended up getting, and what was the biggest concern, is that as this was going along, Followers were starting to realize more and more that Valerie was getting more and more insane. She was starting to come up with celebrity and political hit list of people that they should go after. And you see over time, more and more people were starting to fade away. At one point, Valerie even confesses to the Zodiac killings. And in the ultimate irony, because of her gender and because the way women were looked at, she was never going to be taken seriously. She would literally have had to drag the bodies in there and take care of it from there. Um, but she's just not. And that just one of the two final insults for Valerie. And we see that Valerie just is continuing to go on and slips further and further uh, into her psychosis. And she, at one point, hallucinates a conversation with Andy Warhol. And I want to make sure I get this right. She says to him in just her worst, lowest point, when they hear the name Valerie Salinas, they think Andy Warhol. And Andy Warhol, at least that hallucination, won't even let her have that. He basically says to her that I'm, I'm that, that everything you did and will be remembered for will only be thought of because of me. And he hits her with the line, "I am your legacy," and it's the final line. And in her rage, and in any moment, I would think a sense of clarity she had. Um, she rushes, she dies in you know, slipping and falling and hitting her head, and her story ends. But you see the stark similarities. You see the differences playing out in the gender roles back then. And even that, how they're playing out in terms of Kai and the cult. So we're going to flash back to current time. Hope now is all about killing uh, Kai. And as far as she's concerned, all the ladies have every reason in the world, too. Now, we cut to a point where Kai and Winter meet up. Winter sees Kai um, at their dead parents' 
bedroom, as we mentioned before, the parents are still there rotting. That's, yeah, we're just going to move on from that. Um, but yeah, they're there rotting. Kai's there talking to Winter and basically saying, am I doing right by, by my parents? You know, would they be proud? And really starts laying on the heavy, heavy family guilt to Winter. Like, I couldn't do this without you. I need to have you there. And you start to wonder, okay, this just seems kind of weird timing-wise, even for television, and I know we got to suspend belief. But then we also see that Kai has found the scum manifesto in Winter's room um, and asks her about it. And so, we, again, we get the sense that there's a little bit more going on to this situation than we realize. And I want to make sure that I got this quote correct, um, because I like to do my homework with you guys, um, where he says before she leaves, say hi to the girls for me. So we, we you know, again, there's reasons to suspect that Kai has an idea of what's going on. I mean, I don't think he got to this point if he didn't. But we get to the final scene of the butchery, and we see that there are plans and arrangements being made for a big party for Kai for celebration for winning. And Hilton's there, and he's walking around. He's talking about how he wants to do Game of Thrones and everything else. And next thing you know, Hilton is tied down to a table in the kitchen, and all the ladies are surrounding him, and uh, just one after the other, and particularly Ivy, who takes particular joy in just carving apart Hilton piece by piece by piece. And in the ultimate F you drawing line in the sand, we see Kai watching the television news as breaking news uh, comes on and Hope is doing a breaking news report, essentially reporting on Hilton's body being recovered. And in her dialogue, it's almost as if she's standing in that room talking to Kai saying, look, you don't want this because as much as I built you up, I can tear you back down too. So you need to understand what it is you're dealing with. So again, I give Hope a lot of credit. That was a brilliant move. But spoiler, Kai is Kai for a reason. And as we pan back, we see it's not just Kai that's watching the television. It's also BB. So we're left big, like, what the hell? That is the big uh, question mark um, that I don't think anybody was expecting. Um, curious to see where this is going now that, again, there's only 11 episodes. And we are down to our final four. We still have Charles Manson coming up. Uh, Evan Peters, if you haven't seen that yet, I know I posted that on Bleeding Cool. Um, but that's it, folks. We're going to be back tonight. Uh, we're going to do a live blog for our Winter of Our Discontent, which I'm sure is going to be really a Billy Lord Center episode, which I think would be very cool. So join us. We get the pregame started at uh, 9 p.m. Eastern time, but we start live blogging at 10 p.m. Eastern time. So please make sure to join me then. Uh, thank you guys for being along for this ride, and hopefully you'll be joining me tonight, and next week we can do the recap. Take care.